This is an experiment. What do billionaires, cultural icons, and world-class athletes have in common? I'm about to find out. I'm John Aguilar, serial entrepreneur, former decathlete, and creator and host of the CNN Philippines business reality show, The Final Pitch. Each week, I try to unlock the secrets of Asia's world-class performers to come up with hacks that I can apply in my own life. My goal is to have you apply them in yours. This is the podcast designed to change your life. This is Methods to Greatness. Our guest for today has put the Philippines on the map by becoming one of the most sought-after hosts in Asia. If you're into international talent searches, beauty contests, and reality shows, he has definitely made the rounds. This guy has worn many hats. He's a model, an ambassador, a fitness icon, and a man with never-ending punchlines. Please enjoy my interview with the one and only Robilson Fernandez. Wilson Fernandez, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to physically and organically see another person. <laughs> I know what you mean. I've been talking to people on Zoom the entire day, no yeah. face-to-face contact. Yeah. Uh, we did not shake hands, but no, I was going to give you a hug. Yes, I know. Every time we see each other, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're huggers. I know you are, and, and it, it felt so weird to, to not do that with you. Okay. Um, Revelson, we've known each other, uh, I think, I would think maybe close to 20 years now. Yes, sir. If I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. Uh, I remember the first time that I met you um, was not actually a, a physical meetup, right? Mm -hmm. you, you auditioned for this TV show way back when that I also auditioned for. This was mm -hmm. Game Plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was around early 2000s, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We both auditioned and you got the job. You know, corruption does pay. <laughs> corruption works. Bribing directors, it really does. No, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it, it, I, that was the first time where I was up against... Um, I, every. Let me rewind. Up to that moment, things went pretty easy for me in the TV industry. Uh, I was able to get just gigs miraculously either through dumb luck or, or just I had the lowest rate, you know? So one or the other. But uh, this was the first time I really wanted this gig. Like, I never prayed harder than anything before, for anything before. And, um, and I remember, oh, but you have to audition. You right. have to go up against other people, right. you know, for this, for, this, uh, for this hosting gig. And I was like, really, who am I up against? Whatever, I got this. And then I saw the resume of everybody and... I had no idea at the time that there were so many other talented male hosts in the Philippines. If I'm not mistaken, I think 10 of us auditioned for those two spots, or, or was it four, four spots. Uh, there were yeah. 10, 10 to 15 yes. who auditioned. They were going to get two girls and two guys. That's right. Right? That's and right. you and Carlo, who was my producer for my uh, audition video, you were the two who got the job. Yes, that's right. It was kind of weird that Carlo was a producer at the time. Exactly. Right. You, you know what happened. Okay. You know what happened. So, um, Carlo, after the audition, right, so we all had to make an audition video, right? So the producers of Game Plan had to shoot each individual auditionees. Uh, is that even a word? Aud aud audition we'll take taker. It. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's your podcast. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, they had to shoot our, our, our segment, right? Uh -huh. And um, Carlo... Uh, gave me a call. And I remember it was, it was raining hard that day. He gave me a call. He said, uh, you know, John, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to say that um, you, didn't get the, you didn't get the job. Really? And, and he was saying, yeah, so as it turns out, they, they, they got this, this guy, Revilson, and I had seen you, right? Okay. I had seen you. I, I knew that you were going to get the, the, the part, right? Oh, yeah. Like, just okay. because... Dude, the you, physicality. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Seriously. Yeah. I mean, I, mean no, I didn't have no, the talent, but no, I had the physical. <laughs> no, no contest. <laughs> no. But he, he says, next, he says, um, and apparently they also got me to be one of the hosts. <laughs> so you can imagine how that made me feel. So I remember it was raining hard. I <laughs> practically drove through the floods. Next thing I knew, the, the water was up to my, my window in my car. 
right? So I was like totally in shock. But that was like a, a, a big moment for me. It was like, oh my God. And I think a few episodes into that season, mm -hmm. when I saw the two of you, I knew why you got the job. Uh, one of the producers, uh, I'm not sure if it was um, Garlic or G, they said that they, they used to call you uh, Mr. Upsot. And for people who are not familiar with that term, upsot means uh, up sound on tape. You are so good at um, giving these spontaneous mm -hmm. um, stories. And that, that's really, I think, a testament to how good you are as a host. Mm -hmm. And you were so good, they say, at being um, just this, this character when someone points a camera at you. Mm. Um, just how you take over mm. that scene or that shot. Were you always this good as a host? Oh, wow, thank you. I really appreciate that compliment. I, I do remember them calling me that, uh, apart from the one that they really called me, which was Bon Jing. That was my real nickname <laughs> in uh, the game plan, amongst the game plan staff, so Bon Jing. But Mr. Upsot came a close second, and I really appreciated that. And uh, I, I just never thought uh, that applied to me. Uh, I actually get very nervous when a camera is pointed at me. So it, it's just uh, maybe when I see that red light, you know, uh, the red on tally light on top of the camera, I just go into host mode. But I was always a fan of watching people on TV be really good at, uh, you know, uh, commanding presence on, on screen and on camera. And uh, that fascinated me, you know. Um, um, and, and just the spontaneity of another fan of mine, Eddie Murphy, you know, when I would yeah. watch him and, and I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy and, and just I love the wit of, of stand-up comedians because they're so observational. That's, that's what makes them click and, and, and they, you know, pick things uh, from, from out of the uh, space that we're used to seeing. So, uh, thank you. I appreciate that comment. No, um, I don't, I, 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 uh, I'm honored to have it, but I... I don't know where it came from. Yeah. You don't know where it came from, but I do know that you're a big fan of cinema. Yes. Uh, you've always said in, in your previous interviews that um, you, I think, had you not done what you're doing now, you would have probably been a director. Yes. What is it about the medium that really resonates with you? Well, I was actually going to film school at the time, and everybody at film school wanted to be a director. Nobody there wanted to be a director of photography or a production designer. Script writing was, was uh, you know, also down on the totem pole, but everybody wanted to be a director because was, this was in the 90s at the time of the, the research. The, the po directors were, coming very, were becoming very popular, you know. Um, and uh, so I was maybe really enamored in love with that title. And then you come to the Philippines, like the director is revered here, you know, Derek. They're all right, called Derek, right. you know, they're not even called their real name. They're just called Derek, <laughs> uh, the, uh, demigods in a way. So, but then I realized after hosting and after working with directors, I realized I like hosting. I'm okay with, you know, free coffee and uh, uh, reading my script and memorizing it. I, I don't want to be consumed 100% with, with it. It, it, took a, it takes a lot more work that I wasn't... Uh, uh, ready for, but now in my in what I'm really interested in is the creative process. You know, script writing. I am a writer uh, all, as well, and and I love that process a lot more than directing. So um, it took me this long to figure out what I really wanted to do. But hosting, which was accidental, I absolutely love, and I'm still learning the craft and writing and production, uh, uh, pre-production. Absolutely adore it, and I love that process as well. So, so there. Sorry. So all the directors out there, you guys are doing a great job, but not for me. <laughs> now, you know, I've known you for, for, for a while now. Mm. And one thing that I know about you is that um, you're a very fun-loving guy, right? That, 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 that's like a given, right? But, but I also know that you're also very uh, private. Um, you do have your quiet moments. And, and, you know, when one time you told me that uh, you really just need your downtime, right? Because mm -hmm. I can imagine what... Ravilson Fernandez's life can be weeks on end. Prior to COVID, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I would see you out all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you would have gigs here in the Philippines. You would have gigs um, outside of the country. It must be, it must be quite a tough, um, it, mu it must be quite tough being who you are. 
mm -hmm. um, being right now at least um, uh, an international icon in terms of hosting in, in Southeast. Is it Asia? It's in Asia, right? Yes, yes, you're, you're, yes. You're pretty yes. much around Asia right yes, now. Yes, 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 pretty much. I would, I would include China as Asia, China. part of Asia, uh -huh. yes. Um, um, it's, it's such an honor, you know, it really is to do what we do and, um, you know, to, the fact that we call it work, but it's not even close to work, you know. Of course, uh, you know, the, the, the typical quote of do something you love and, uh, you know, never work a day in your life. And it so rings true for what I've been doing. And, you know, to do this from an international level as well, because I always, I always put it in terms of I'll never be a professional athlete, you know, but I love sports so much. I'll never be an athlete that will go to the Olympics and represent my country, the Philippines. But how I can best represent being Filipino is doing international work and just killing it on stage, you know, and just doing something that Filipinos are proud of. Like, oh, wow, si Ruvil Sinyan, I'm Pinoy yon, ah. he's, he's Pinoy, ah. he's one of us, ah. he's from the Gupan. Ah. Yeah, I swear, <laughs> he, I heard he's from the Gupan. You know, so um, I'm, I'm really, that's my way of giving back you know, um, to the Philippines because the Philippines has given me so much and it's, it's made me who I am to this day. Uh, I came here raw, you know, coming fresh out of film school with a big attitude and a big, big ego, but it, it, was, it was a big slice of humble pie coming here. And, uh, you know, my 20 years here far outshine my 26 years of living in the States, you know, hands down. Let's talk a little yeah. bit about that. So your past, you were born in Japan. Yes, sir. And raised in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And at age, what age did you uh, move back to the Philippines? You were around 20, 26. 26? Yeah, yeah. So you were fully formed in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You're what people would call an amboy. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, coming here, you said big ego, you know, mm -hmm. you felt like you, you had a lot to prove. Mm -hmm. What was that like coming from the U.S., um, being in that culture and all of a sudden being thrust to the Philippines? What kind of adjustments did you have to make as a quote-unquote foreigner mm -hmm. um, in a new land, so to speak, mm -hmm. but obviously your roots are here. What mm -hmm. was that transition like for you? Oh, it was, it was fantastic. It really wasn't that tough because we as a family were already coming to the Philippines every couple years for Christmas. We'd go straight to the province. We wouldn't hang out in Manila, but that's exactly what we wanted. You know, we, were, we wanted as boys to be raised on the farm as, as how our grandparents were and our parents were. Uh, so I didn't fully immerse myself until, into Manila life until I moved to Manila on, when I was 26. And the reason why uh, I moved here is because I wanted to do something grand and different and epic before the new millennium. So that was in you know, 2000, 1999. October 99 is when I moved here. And, and, uh, uh, but prior to that, it took a year to get to the Philippines. I had to do a lot of paperwork. I had to pay off bills. I had to you know, put in my two weeks notice. I had to save up, sell my car. So it was a concentrated effort. It was a journey I was prepared to do. You know? and, and I wanted to come here with clean slate and, and just ready to work. You know? And I love Asia and I love the Philippines. And uh, I remember watching uh, my mom and I, because she, we were one of the first people to have TFC in our in our neighborhood, and and my mom would watch it. She would be glued to the TV set, and uh, she would watch her favorite show. I remember was every Friday, uh, like clockwork, sitting down in front, and she would be glued to the TV watching Keep On Dancing. Do you remember the TV show <laughs> called Keep On Dancing? So the stars of vaguely, Keep On Dancing. Vaguely. Okay. So the stars of Keep On Dancing were uh, hosted by three guys, Franco Lorel, okay. uh, a guy named Mark Nelson. I don't know if you've heard of oh, him. Oh, I've heard of him, and, yeah. And uh, Troy Montero, <laughs> okay. who in 99, 98, if, if Piolo Pascual was is the big time, you know, boy, man star, <laughs> He was like five times that. Okay. This is before the internet. Okay. Like everybody, right, right, Troy right, Montero right, right, was right, Troy right, Montero, right. right? And and my mom was all into him. So a, a show where Mark Nelson is the third most bogey guy <laughs> is like, wow, what a show, you know? And I was I would just sit there, and I had no intentions yet of moving to the Philippines, but I, I was just like watching and and seeing how happy my mom was, and <laughs> and and just she was so lost and engaged in it. And I was like. I want to put that kind of happiness into my mom. And I was like, you know, thinking I could do what they're doing. So you host. wanted to be Mark Nelson. 
<laughs> so that was the impetus for you to move back to the Philippines. <laughs> Troy Montero, naman. Okay. not Mark Nelson. Troy Montero, <laughs> then. So, but instead, I became Casey Montero. <laughs> <laughs> Go malay. figure. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, malay. No, but uh, yeah, so there. Uh, that was nine. I don't forgot what year that was, but then yeah, ninety nine, October ninety nine. I, I moved here, and and it's it's it's. So yeah. hold on. You wanted to be a matinee <laughs> idol. Is that what you wanted to be? No, 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 no. I just wanted to be an entertain. I just wanted to be in entertainment at some capacity in okay. the Philippines. Okay. Because it looks like so much fun. And if these three jokers can do it, except for Franco. <laughs> Franco's galing. Okay. If, if these jokers can do it, I can do it. You know, that's what I thought. You know, why not, right? And uh, they look like they were having fun. And, and, you know, you get to work with, you know, amazing people. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So, I want to get into the show that I would say, at least in my opinion, really made you, you, at least in the, in the context of the Asian region. Mm -hmm. I think um, your appearance on The Amazing Race Asia, mm -hmm. I think was, at least in my opinion, you, you were literally put on the map mm -hmm. of Asia as a candidate to be that next great host. I don't know how much of it was accidental. I don't know how much of it was really you using that as a platform mm -hmm. for you to get out there and be known. What was your intention? I, I know you and Mark really had your heart set on that. Mm -hmm. What was your intention coming into The Amazing Race Asia? Thank you so much for, for uh, that great introduction regarding Amazing Race Asia. Out of all the TV shows I've done internationally and locally, yes, that, win, that show leaves the biggest dent in my heart, you know, uh, because number one, it was my greatest victory just getting on that show for season two as well. That, that, that season was amazing um, out of the five seasons, and, and that's without a doubt. Um, and, and also, on the flip side of that, it was also my worst defeat. Right. So, you know, without getting into the... Because you were second place there, right? We actually were third place. You were third place. Yes, so we were never eliminated, which is the, one of our goals. But people think we were second, right. but we were third, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. I so, didn't know that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the, the, they made it seem like you were second, but... Oh, yeah, but then the, okay. the, the Malaysian sisters just swooped in underneath oh, us wow. and took second place. And okay. then, yeah, we wound up with the Consolation third. And wow. it, ended, it ended in a fantastic way. If you followed that show from beginning to end, which most of Southeast Asia did at the time, because this, remember, was pre-internet. Right, This right. was right before... We were um, hooked. Yes. And we were rooting for you, man. Yes. You and, you and Mark. Yes. Families were still watching TV together. Right, right. You know? And uh, I remember, we, you know, lots of friends and, and, and family members would also tell us uh, we would watch you guys during dinner. You know, my mom <laughs> would always say, turn off the TV uh, before. But, of course, this was the first time in a long time the family actually watched TV with Amazing Race Asia going on. And I was so, you know, so touched by that. We were um, some of my, you know, out of all the things that uh, uh, people say, coming up to me regards, in regards to Amazing Race Asia. My favorite, one was, my favorite one will still always be, I remember watching you with my mom, you know, or my Lola, and we would, we would root for you. And, and that's what I love, you know, a shared family experience, which we don't get anymore now in, in, with our media landscape, you know. Everything's solitary and, and solo. So, yeah, sorry, I can go into different tangents regarding this, but, yeah, that was pre, super premeditated, bro. Right. Super premeditated, right. uh, Amazing Race Asia. Okay, starting with as early as the audition team. Okay, okay. For us, um, and I highly... So, okay, it's, it's okay. A take, me through, mm -hmm. take me through what made your audition tape successful. Because I'm sure out of the thousands, um, an audition tape has to really shout and scream who you are and why you should be part of the show. What was it about the process of putting it together? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, apart from the fact that you guys are professional... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, hosts, mm -hmm. right? What was it that made your audition tape so good? Well, Mark and I, we said, we're already hosts. Let's not, let, let's take advantage of that. Let's use our resources in the industry. Let's put together a kick-ass audition tape because in all honesty, the real race is the auditions. 
not the, the amazing race itself. You're only going against 11 other teams. In the audition process, you're going against thousands of teams. So you have to make yourself stand out there. That's where we really concentrated. And we, like I said, we, took all, we got all our resources. We hired a uh, world-class photographer, Raymond Isaac. Okay, we borrowed wow. his studio. He came with a wonderful makeup artist. We got uh, Buco, Randall Buco Raimundo, mm -hmm. who did yep, our cinematography. Yep, yep. Rafi Francisco was our director. We had sound. Okay. I had a script. I wrote it. Uh, it was inspired from the Apple commercial at the time. Okay. It was, uh, I'm a PC. I'm a Mac. I'm a PC. Do you remember that yep, uh, commercial? Yeah. Um, so I, of course, was the... PC and Mark was the Mac <laughs> and we were just showing our differences and okay. uh, yeah so you I, I hope you can play the commercial because I mean the audition tape it's only three minutes long yeah. or you can google it on uh, on on uh, YouTube we'll, we'll put that on the show notes yeah actually yeah. you should it, yeah. it's 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 one of my finest pieces of work nice. I mean seriously nice. and and so we and, we, and we, very successful at that I mean it, I think it's a study on um, you know trying to make an impact auditioning for a reality show Right? Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. You want to wow them already. And we know that the audition tape, you knowing this after seeing thousands, you have to be knocked off your, your, off your feet within the first minute because you will, if you have thousands to look through, you'll turn it off. And that's what, the, that's what we had in our, men, in our mentality. It's like we have to wow them within the first minute. If we lose them, then why would anyone want to watch us? So, yeah, we sent in our tape. And the funny thing is, too, our tape, the process of our tape had its own amazing race. It's like, so we shot it, it took a day. Editing, editing it took another day. We were, the deadline to send it in was two days away. Wow. So uh, mailing back then, you know, Manila to Singapore might have taken a couple days. But buti na lang, Mark had a, a, a modeling gig in Singapore oh, the so next he, day. He physically so brought he the So he physically tape. brought it to That's AXM. That's cutting it yes, close. Yes, cutting it close. A Amazing race, <laughs> right? So uh, uh, he brought it, he ran, after his photo shoot, wow. he ran to AXN Studios uh, Network in uh, Tampinis in Singapore, dropped it off on the desk to the, to the secretary and said, here's our audition tape. So, you know, we were praying that uh, he made it, he did, and, and we uh, had no idea how we d would do. You know, we just put out the best thing that we, we uh, could make and we were proud of it. And we waited and... Um, I'll tell you this right now. Uh, Michael McKay, the producer of, uh, um, of Amazing Race Asia, he told us and in, 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 uh, pulled us aside one day uh, and he said, your audition tape was the best I've ever seen. And, you know, coming from him, wow. we were just like, wow, you know. And uh, so there, um, that, that was just getting into the race, getting our audition tape it was already an amazing race for us, but it was so worth it because, you know, we, we put a lot of time and effort and that made us realize if you do your research, you put your work in, you put your time in, you will get great returns back. You know what I'm saying? So, so yeah, we got in and um, we, we realized once we got in, we had some rules. We also made some premeditated rules. Okay. Mark Nelson, number one, never argue. Never argue on TV. They want that. We do not want to look like the You didn't squabbling. want to play that game. We didn't want to play okay. that game. We All didn't right. want to go that route, you okay. know? We'll always be the happy-go-lucky Filipino team that, like, you know, is happy to be there and, and, and feeling this is blessed and just going with the flow. Uh, number two, no romantically, do not get romantically involved with any of the other co-hosts. That was an actual rule. That, that was a rule. With each other. That was a rule. Okay. That was a rule. So, uh, because we had to focus. We had to focus on the show. And again, we knew the producers wanted that, oh, that okay. angle. Right. Uh, and there, I think there were a few pretty girl, girls there, right? I mean, there were a couple. Bro, when we walked into the first meeting... We then the, the, all the teams were ahead of us. We thought we were in the wrong audition. We thought it was for you know uh, top model Asia top model. <laughs> we're like, well, what? I don't show though. <laughs> amazing race. Is this amazing? Oh, so good. okay. So um, yeah, and uh, uh, yeah. So those were the two main rules. And then number three, have fun. Okay. Number three was have fun, have fun, and uh, represent the Philippines as best we could. So. Yeah, so we went in with that mindset. Didn't even care about winning. Mark and I never talked about winning at all. Okay. We, we just, our focus was to have fun, play fair, represent the Philippines as best you can, don't fight, and 
um, don't fall in love. So, wow. Wow. so that was it. You know, we kept it simple and uh, always were respect was respectful of everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, it, 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 it was an amazing experience, bro. Right. Amazing experience. Yeah. And, and I think to me, it makes sense the way you approached it because um, being in your profession, I think in a lot of ways that was also your, your demo to Asia, essentially, right? I mean, putting yourself out there using that platform. Mm -hmm. And now looking back, I can see how successful and effective you were using that platform to now getting the kind of gigs and opportunities that you now enjoy with Mark. I mean, you mm -hmm. guys have been everywhere. Um, mm -hmm brand ambassadors for the biggest brands. Mm -hmm. um, you've hosted, um, well, recently, the biggest one was really um, uh, Asia's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and Mark have really mm -hmm. put yourselves out there to mm -hmm. be, I guess, the, the, the best male hosts in the region, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to find out how much of your branding mm -hmm. was you and Mark. I mean, you obviously have your own strengths, your, your own diff your differences, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But how much of it was you just agreeing that, okay, we will brand ourselves as like the dynamic duo mm -hmm. and do this together for the long haul? Mm -hmm. It just came naturally, you know? Uh, all the differences between us were so in sync, you know? It, it, it just happened organically. And it, it was so successful for us. It worked. You know, I don't want to say we finished each other's sentences like a, like a married couple, but we, we had the same jokes. We had similarities, uh, similar likes, similar dislikes. But I, I also, there's a lot of things that I, I, we don't get along with. You know, we don't, uh, he likes, uh, he doesn't like spicy food. I love spicy food. He doesn't eat seafood. So it sucks to go out with him because we can't eat at seafood restaurants. Um, uh, he doesn't like to run. He doesn't like sports, uh, watching sports on TV. Uh, and some of the things that he does, I, uh, some of the things that I do, he also you know, doesn't like as well. So um, I don't know. It's just a perfect gelling and matching of uh, two buddies, you know, two buddies. And I think back in that time, uh, the early 2000s, the, the buddy formula you know, was, was just starting. No one um, was doing it yet. No right? one was doing yeah. it yet, mm -hmm. right? Everyone was solo. Everyone wanted to, to, I think we were the first super team host. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, we were trying to be, right. uh, the, we were the Miami Heat of uh, hosting, I guess you would say. I don't know who was LeBron, but you know, <laughs> LeBron and Wade teaming up. So um, yeah, and, and, and it makes work so much easier. And, and more fun, and the audience sees it, client sees it. When we're working together, we're riffing off each other. And all this, and, and from an economic standpoint, hey, you get two hosts for one, you know? You get, you get two hosts for one, and um, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, it was a brand that uh, I'm so glad. I never thought of monetizing it or, or, or you know, bringing it to where it is now, but it's, it's, just been, it's just been natural. It's been a natural progression of it. So yeah, it's cool. It's cool. I don't know where to go from here. Do we get married? You know, what, what do we do next, you know? Maybe you'll do another first with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can produce it. <laughs> That's an idea right there. Yeah, hey, double, double, yeah, Dragon's <laughs> Nest, okay. Now let's go back to um, Asia's Got Talent. Mm. Obviously that's a big brand. And um, with Simon Cowell, being the, um, I guess, the, the genesis for all of that. I mean, yeah. uh, I remember one time we had coffee. Uh, I had asked you to have coffee with me because I knew that with your experience in the regional circuit, right, mm -hmm. um, um, we were planning on um, launching an Asian show, which is the, the ASEAN version of the final pitch. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to hear from someone who's been around the region exactly what it takes, what kind of mentality it takes to, to be able to, to, to approach a regional audience. Because we've always been producing shows in, here in the Philippines. We've mm -hmm. never had to create something that would have the greater Southeast Asian region in mind. Mm -hmm. You were very successful in being that face, at least you and Mark, for mm -hmm. the region. Um, so I, I, I had coffee with you. Mm -hmm. um, and like the level of insight that I got was just off the charts. I mean, you... Um, explaining to me exactly um, the kind of level that 
uh, you know, these producers um, based in Singapore were at, right? Mm. Um, talk to me about that kind of, um, I guess, quality that our, 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 our neighbors in, in Singapore mm -hmm. um, are coming out with. Because obviously, these are big brands, these are big shows, mm -hmm. and you are a big part of making that happen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, as much as I love Manila, you know, and, and it, it plays a huge role in my formation, Singapore as well is my second home, you know, career-wise. Uh, everything amazing has happened in Singapore. It, of course, is the headquarters for all networks right. in Southeast Asia, right. if not Asia. And, uh, yeah, I was there quite frequently, almost averaging once every month, maybe, once every two months, just flying back and forth. It's a second home. I love everybody there. I love the food. I love the culture. But when you work in Singapore, it's Ibang level. You know, I would consider it the Hollywood level of Asia, you know, and um, the greats work there. You know, people from Hollywood or Bollywood or Chinese film, uh, Chinese cinema would, would also converge into uh, Singapore. So it was such an honor to, to be involved and working closely with, for me, Ang Pinaka, you know, the creme de la creme of Southeast Asia. And uh, you learn things, you know, you, you, you'd be wise not to pick up things and learn things. Uh, they have a way, they have a system. They're much more efficient than we are. Uh, I like the Philippines working environment better than theirs. They're a little too serious for me, but you know, I mean, to each their own. I feel we're a little more creative. Um, we have more flair where there's a little bit more flavor in the things we do, but them, they are technically superior. Um, you know, uh, progressive, their uh, advancements in, in, in technology and writing as well. Their writing is, is, is pretty good. So uh, it was just a mesh of two worlds and it was such, an, uh, such a treat, Deba, right? to, to work in Singapore. And um, yeah, it, it, they're definitely very underrated um, and we can learn a lot from them. Yeah, yeah. government-wise too. Government-wise, oh, definitely, definitely. Just the just, <laughs> just sheer amount of support that the creative industry gets from the government. Um, mm -hmm. I think if we had the same support, I think um, our local entertainment industry would be so much better. I mean, um, we have, the, like you said, we have the talent. And one thing I noticed also, though, is that um, a lot of these Singapore shows mm -hmm. or Singapore produced or owned shows mm -hmm. um, would actually get Filipino talents or in some cases even shoot their content here. I think um, they've recognize that Filipinos, like mm -hmm. you said, mm -hmm. have the flair. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, well, obviously the, the English speaking mm -hmm. um, uh, skills, right? Mm -hmm. um, even, I guess, the, the, the resonance with the Western culture, I mm -hmm. think is something that you can easily mm -hmm. um, translate mm -hmm. um, um, across the region. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's, you and, and, and Mark were one of the pioneers in making them see that they could actually tap um, hosts, talents from the Philippines. The number of years where I saw Filipinos as maybe a big part of that reality show, mm -hmm. I can't even count because it almost seems like every time there's a new reality show, there's got to be an, a standout Filipino there somewhere. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. I t completely agree. I, I, I look forward to new reality shows globally and... Uh, uh, yeah, globally, pa, not just here in Asia, because I know we've already broken that ceiling. Pinoys are amazing. Uh, to, they, they just add a little bit of spice to the show. And um, uh, I, I hope they get casted more, you know? I hope we get casted more. Um, well, speaking of which, I was just listening to Rex Navarrete, who just started a podcast. Oh, it's called okay. The Flip Chronicles. Check it out. All right. Phenomenal. The Phenomenal. original, even before Jokoy, right? Oh. He was, he was the Jokoy of, I guess, our time, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. He was here in the Philippines for a good part of maybe the late 90s, was That's that? That's right. Or That's early right. 2000s, something yeah. like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. You are correct. The Jokoy before Jokoy right. was Jokoy. I'm right. sure Jokoy clearly was inspired from Rex Navarrete. Brilliant guy. And he was interviewing on his podcast. His first guest was uh, Ruben Nepales, the film critic. I oh, believe. yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. From the Inquirer. Now Correct. he's with Rappler. Correct. And they were mentioning, uh, they were so proud of, uh, what's his, oh, Darren Chris. Okay, Darren sorry. Chris. I, okay. I don't know who Darren is. I believe Chris he was is. on Glee. Uh, that's where he was founded. But then 
he shot off into fame by being, uh, he played the role of Andrew Cunanan in the Netflix series, Andrew Cunanan. And then from there, he had a huge role and a producer role in the new Netflix show, Hollywood. Did you see that? Oh, okay. Oh, no, you gotta no. see that. Okay. okay. And the greatest part about this is he's Pinoy. He recognizes that he's Filipino. And he's not just a performer, but he's a producer, and he is just rising the ranks of, of Hollywood's elite. And nice. I'm so proud that he recognizes being Pinoy. And in fact, his role in Hollywood, which is based in the 1940s, he literally said, I am Filipino in the script. Oh, sorry. So, you know what? Now, now I remember. Yes, uh -huh. yes. I've seen it with my wife. Cool. Hollywood, yes. Yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, the, I, I remember. It was about racial, uh, uh, right. a lot of undertones that we don't talk about back right. then. It was, but he didn't look Filipino at did all. Did not look right? Filipino. Yeah. Did not look Filipino. But uh, sang like a Pinoy, though. <laughs> yeah, well, he didn't sing there. But um, yeah, they, they just brought up him. And, and I was listening to it. And I was like, God, it's, he's an amazing person that uh, Filipinos can look up to. You know, And of course, they also mentioned the Basco brothers, Dante Basco and his brothers, uh, Dion and all them. They're also doing, uh, they've been in the business for a long time, but uh, they're, they're making waves again. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, Pinoy's were, were doing fantastic from the front of the camera, but I'd really like to see more of us behind the camera, right. you know, uh, more Filipino writers, more Filipino directors, people like yourselves, future media moguls, you know, I'm so proud <laughs> of you guys because you guys call the shots, you know, and, um, no one can ever tell you no. Let's let's not put that in. Let's let's uh, leave that out. You, you, you get to do whatever you want, and that's the way it should be, you know. And you should be proud of your, your, your culture and your upbringing and where you're from, and and have it represented in your work, you know. So the future looks bright for us, you know, is what I'm saying. Hopefully, we get out of this pandemic alive. But I'm really excited for. Aren't you excited for the stories? that'll come out when this is all done. Oh, definitely, definitely. Like the stand-up comedians, I cannot wait for the stand-up comedians. <laughs> the, just the all their material their out there, Yes, right? and the, <laughs> the rom-coms that are gonna come out of this, the pandemic, you know, uh, uh, short stories, the independent films that'll come out of this, the music. Oh, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. The, the, it's just, it's like a, like a boiling, uh, all these things are held in, in, in this pot ready to explode, you know, and uh, of creativity. So we're going to have a renaissance of creativity soon, and I'm excited for it. No doubt. No doubt. That's yeah, going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So, so Dave Chappelle was recently here in Manila, and apparently uh, when we had coffee that time, apparently that was your idea. It's just a guy, huge fan of stand-up comedy, and uh, at the time, Solaire was looking for new acts to bring in uh, apart from their musicals. But of course, musicals take about three months and then they're gone and then you have a big empty space not, not uh, earning you money. And uh, I went up to uh, the powers that be, uh, f who's a dear friend of mine, and I said, you know what, uh, why don't we bring in stand-up comedy, you know, uh, or stand-up comedians here? Because they're the new superstars, you know? I mean, Kevin Hart is the number one actor oh, or sure. number one yeah. celebrity mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave Chappelle, you know, um, uh, Will Ferrell, everybody who's funny, everybody who's fantastic in the entertainment world started off in stand-up comedy. Right. And from a production standpoint, I've never produced anything before in my life, but I would think it's quite cheaper to produce a stand-up comedy act <laughs> than it is to produce Les Mis, right? right. So, uh, you know, maybe cost efficiency-wise, I think it's better to just fly them in. Their entourage isn't so big. Their uh, writer isn't so crazy. So uh, I planted a seed in their head and uh, we uh, meetings kind of waned and uh, nothing came about it of it. And I get a call from a dear friend in LA who's in the business and he calls me up and he says, hey man, I heard Dave Chappelle is coming to the Philippines. And I was like, oh really? Wow, no way. How? Who's doing this? And he said, your guy from Solaire, he's here. He just signed the deal. And I was... I didn't know how to feel, but my number one feeling though was I was so happy. By hook or by crook, I just wanted Dave Chappelle here. I wanted the number one comic in the world to be here in the Philippines so it can inspire our comics, you know, to, to be like, oh my God, my, my idol is here. I, 
you need your inspiration, you know, to, 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 you need to see it, the, your inspiration in the flesh. You need to be there and witness it and feel the vibe. And, and this was the greatest boom for Philippine, for the Philippine stand-up comedy scene and, and artists like that. And I'm so glad Soler had the balls to do it, you know, and, um, and unfortunately the pandemic happened and, uh, uh, so we lost a bit of that momentum, but stand-up comedy is here to stay. Filipino comics are amazing. Uh, thanks to Joe Coy and, you know, Rex Navarrete and, of course, Dave Chappelle, who's married to a Pinay, who loves the Philippines. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Married to a Filipina. And uh, so we, I think, the Manila, uh, Philippines and Manila was trying to be the stand-up comedy of, of Southeast Asia, uh, stand-up comedy headquarters of Southeast Asia. And we, our trajectory is still uh, on that path, so... Um, again, everything will happen when this pandemic is done, but I'm, I'm excited for it. Did you right. watch him? Uh, no, no. I watched Jokoi. I think that was yeah. the same weekend, right? Good for you. Yeah, it was the same weekend. <laughs> yeah. So was... again, I was so proud of the Philippines for being the center of comedy universe. At you least know, for we, that we night, right? For that yeah. night. But we can do it, is what I'm saying, yeah. you know? And it, you gave Filipinos another option for entertainment. Exactly. You know, that, that made me feel like, wow, Manila's a world-class city. Right. For one night... In, in this year, I feel like Manila is on top of the world. We are, we are headline news. We are the, the creme de la creme. It, it made me feel so proud of Manila and so proud of Soler and so proud of, of uh, and so happy for our Philippine audience. They got something different, yeah. you know? Diba? Yeah. One of the biggest trends in fitness right now is the proliferation of home gyms. And we've partnered with Italian wellness solutions provider Technogym to give you your weekly dose of high-tech fitness equipment and exercises that you can consider for your home. Joining me is Technogym Philippines Sales Director Marvin Navarro. So Marv's, our equipment for today is none other than the Techno Gym Scale Row. Nice. So John, this is our indoor rower. Um, when Techno Gym endeavored to create this machine, they really wanted to do it right and to be the best in the market. So they partnered with Olympic rowing medalist Scott Durant to come up with the design and the features of it. As you can see here, there's a logo of Aqua Peel. It actually feels like you're rowing on water. You row indoors, but when you go to, you know, the water already, it translates perfectly. It's also the only rower in the market that where you can train cardiovascular endurance and strength. This knob, the white part shows you what you're using air resistance, but once you reach the red, you're already using magnetic resistance. And that magnetic resistance allows you to do strength training. So that is unique in the market. Like every other Techno Gym machine now, there is a digital component to it. So it has a dedicated app, which I want to demo to you. You can do different programs. Let's do an interval program. Let's demo it for you. Okay, so you can see here we have a pace boat. So it makes it a little bit more interactive. You have someone that you can race with. Here, you can see the profile of your stroke. So they say that the perfect stroke has somewhat of a bell shape in terms of the resistance profile or your effort profile. And lastly, you can find more parameters of the workout. So with the mobile application, you can do so much more with the skill row. I always used to just consider rowing machines as a piece of equipment for cardio. Now this piece of equipment has blown my mind away. It's practically a weights machine in that it can give you the kind of resistance that you would normally get from you know, the heavier back exercises that you would do in the gym. If you're someone who's very particular about the time that you put in the gym, I highly recommend the skill row. It's an awesome piece of equipment. 
Methods to Greatness in partnership with Techno Gym Philippines has come up with recommended fitness at home equipment to power your workouts. These are fitness solutions designed to drive and complement your training, whether you're a seasoned multi-sport athlete or you just want the very best equipment for your home gym. So get in touch with a Techno Gym consultant at sales at esports.ph via mobile at 63917. 5745578 or through technogym.com and give the promo code MTG. That's the Methods to Greatness promo code MTG and the experts over at Techno Gym will hook you up with the best premium home gym equipment and gear available in the market today. Okay, so Revelson, I want to get into um, the other big part of your life, mm -hmm. which is not Mark, but <laughs> your, I would say your athletic career, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you were never like a professional athlete, but mm -hmm. obviously now you are as fit as an ox. I mean, you work out like crazy, right? You've been in the cover of Men's Health, you know, rocking that, um, that, uh, that tight fit muscle <laughs> shirt. And up till now, man, I mean, you are fit. I mean, I've seen you work. I mean, we've... We've competed before in races, and, and, and I know just how strong you are mm -hmm. as, even as a runner. I mean, you're, you're, like, you're, you're huge, but at the same time, you, you really have the endurance of, I would even say, a middle-distance runner. I mean, I've seen, you, mm. I've seen you run, man. You can really mm. log in those miles. You've done a couple of marathons also. What, what is the secret to staying in shape the, the way that you are, you know, having the lifestyle that you have? Mm -hmm. um, what, what does it take to, to be at that level, at this age, and with what you do? I absolutely just enjoy being out there and just getting sweaty. And, and I love the team sports concept of uh, uh, either winning or losing, but just playing the game right. Everything that encompasses sports, you know, winning last second shot or losing by 20 points or... Uh, you know, the crowd or no crowd or, or, or trash talking, just every, at Borma, everything that is related to the game, I absolutely love, you know. And uh, uh, yes, I was never a professional sports. I was, uh, uh, you know, not of high caliber, but I always gave my best, you know. I always gave my best and, and um, the best inspired me. I always tried to race against them. Uh, I knew my I knew my place, but you know what? It's sports. You might win one day. You might win one day. You might not. But uh, you know, play the odds. So that's what I absolutely love about it. That's what I absolutely adore. And there's no greater time than now that health is so important. You know, and uh, it's it's quite tough if you were never sporty to just to get into it. But you know, if it's been a part and parcel of your life, which it has been for mine, it. Uh, it's, it's easy to just get back into it. And um, it, it's, you know, sports, health, wellness, and fitness has also been very good to me financially, you know. All right, uh, you're, you're right now the Spartan ambassador. Yes, sir. Of the Philippines, right? Yes, 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 um, yes. And you've competed in, in, in a couple of really tough races. You, you, you just don't do the sprints, right? You do everything. You do the beast. You do the trifecta. And for those who don't know much about Spartan race, um, Give us a clue what, what, it, what it takes, because we, we've, uh, we've raced together in some. Yeah. But for those who haven't done it, yeah. uh, what's it like? Spartan Race is basically an obstacle course uh, set across uh, designated uh, distances, usually, tw uh, well, it's now 10 kilometers, uh, 15 kilometers, or up to 21 kilometers, so three different levels. And then you just have various uh, obstacle courses strewn across uh, certain types of terrain. Some, some races can be muddy, some races can be up in the hills, some races can be in the desert. And that's what's fantastic about that. You are just pitting yourself against nature, you're pitting yourself against your uh, colleagues, your fellow Spartans, and the greatest one is you're pitting yourself against yourself. You know, I know it sounds so cheesy, but that is the greatest time to really push yourself. And Spartan, out of all the sports that I've done and participated in, it is the most fulfilling. Um, it combines a lot of different tasks 
and, and body movements and skill sets that you should have practiced for it. And, and it, it's, it's the greatest um, parallel to life. Whereas if you don't train hard enough for something, you won't be successful in it. You can get by, you can cross the finish line, but if you want to cross the finish line a champ and be proud of what your accomplishments, um, you got to work for it. So, and it's a great community too. The Spartan community is amazing. You know, it's yeah, not just for big sure. Brusco guys, yeah. you know, uh, it's also executives, it's mothers, it's paraplegics, it's kids. It's a wonderful community, very supportive of each other. There's no yabang, yabangness in it. And, um, and the medals are shiny and they're pretty <laughs> and they're heavy and they're substantial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I agree totally 100%. But you know what, what um, I think what attracts me to it is that, you know, we're both in our 40s, right? Yes, sir. Um, just the fact that you're out there. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. the sun, sure, you're used to that. But mm -hmm. the mud, right? Mm -hmm. Physically going down, not even on your knees, just really crawling mm -hmm. and submerging yourself under mud and mm -hmm. there's fire mm -hmm. and you know, you've got sweaty people left and right just mm -hmm. inching their way, trying mm -hmm. to make it to the finish line. Mm -hmm. I think to me, it, it, it really, I mean, for me, what it does, it makes me feel, you know, like, uh, hmm, you know, I'm, I'm still capable of doing this stuff. Yes, right? It's like, yes. I don't know, is, is it midlife crisis, you think? I mean... No. It just makes you feel like a, a man, you know? Just, Alive again. Yeah, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I don't know if it's something um, like cavemen uh, would do on a, on a daily basis, but to me... It, it's like you made a fire with your own hands. Right, right. <laughs> but you, in this case, you didn't have to... You just have to jump over the fire. You just have to jump over it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally it's get what fun. you're feeling. It's so yeah. primal. Uh -huh. It's exactly. so exotic it, it, it it's yes, like yes. and i love how uh some guys they they just you know the elite levels they'll strip down they're just running in, in compression shorts right right they're as bare as it's like <laughs> like tarzan talaga you know <laughs> like i'm not that level yet and jane because the women there are tough man oh I've, yeah i mean super the the pride that would be just this small when someone passes you yeah and she's not even like elite level she's just really working hard yeah right so you i mean as you know someone you know with you know just even a little bit of uh, uh pride uh -huh. will refuse to oh be, yeah right i mean it's oh. what i mean you want to stop but you just can't because <laughs> you know bro <laughs> here's the worst ones for me there are some spartans out there who are running and naka uh tutu <laughs> and it's a multicolored tutu. <laughs> There's some uh, Spartans running with uh, feather wings, uh -huh. you know, that like in uh, uh, Victoria's Secrets. Right, they're running. Right, right. And if they're in front of me, I'm like, <laughs> Puta, really? I gotta I'm so tired, but I have to at but least you pass have to the guy least, in the tutu. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> you know, I can't let the guy in the tutu beat me. I remember one time we were doing ultra. Pa, uh -huh. It was the ultra. Uh, so for those who don't know, what also. is ultra? 50 kilometers uh, yeah, over, so right? So I was doing the ultra, which is 50 kilometers. And uh, this is in Porak, Pampanga. Hottest, most treacherous wow. place to, to do a race. And um, uh, I was on my ninth hour of this 10-hour race. I was about to complete it in 10 hours. And maybe the last two kilometers, I was fighting with a guy wearing a tutu, a multicolored tutu, knee-high socks with, he had like uh, uh, power puff rangers on, on, on his socks. And I was like, nothing wrong with his outfit. I just couldn't let New Balance lose to this oh, guy. You okay. know what there I'm saying? Like, there you no. go. <laughs> no, and but that's, uh, that's probably part of his strategy as well, right? <laughs> oh, it just was mind, you out. mind games. Yes, yeah, exactly. super mind games. Yeah, like... And, and, and um, I barely beat him. I barely beat him. But I swear, it was finishing the 50-kilometer race in 10 hours was not my greatest victory. 10 hours. My greatest victory wow. was passing up that dude in the colored, <laughs> multicolored tutu. So we all have our own personal victories, and that was mine. But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, it's a wonderful community. Wonderful, strong, amazing community. It is. I'm glad to be part of it. And after this pandemic, I hope that, you know, we, we, we do a race together, man. We should race in tutus. Yes. And, and like throw mind games with people behind us. Like, oh, you're going to lose to a bading. <laughs> Two bald. Two bald badings. Two oh, you're going to lose to a boy of wonder. <laughs>
<laughs> oh man. All right. So I'm gonna ask you my ten questions. All right. Oh my you goodness. Can, you, you can be fast. You can take your time. All right. Sige. Okay. So having having talked about everything we talked about, so Revelson, what makes you Asian? Specifically, what makes you Filipino? My love for rice. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, what makes me Filipino? You know, Filipino is unlike Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Filipinos are different in, in the way we look. We can be Chinito, we can be Spanish, we can be uh, Mal Malay. That's a Filipino. We all look different. We all have different cultures, we all have different um, um, dialects. So for me, the Filipino is, is a state of mind and puso, you know, because one of the greatest Filipinos I know is Mark Nelson, but he doesn't have an ounce of Filipino blood in him. No way. N zero. So he's actually... He's an Aussie citizen, raised in Australia, but blood-wise, his dad is Burmese, Myanmar, and the mom is English. Oh. Yeah, okay. white lady. Uh, Carol, hello, Mommy Carol. You're good to, good to see you. And... Um, but he is more Pinoy than any Pinoy I know. You know, he, nobody loves the Philippines more than he does. Nobody cares for the Philippines. Um, nobody is so pro Pinoy. Uh, and and it, it's all coming from, you know, puso lang, as he says. So that's what makes me Filipino is it's my heart. Yeah, I have Filipino blood in me, but it's just my attitude and my love for the Philippines, you know. Laban, man. I haven't given up on this country. I will never give up on this country. <laughs> Woo! We're in some trouble now, but I won't give up. Diba? Yeah, well, speaking of the country, what is it about the country, um, whether it's the food, the culture, uh, any weird things or customs that you would love for people outside um, the country, outside of Asia even, to discover? The Philippines, I believe, is the only country you need to come here. You have to stand on our soil. If you, you, know, you can experience Japan in Japan towns all across the world. They, they come pretty close, you know, and Chinatowns. You can experience a Chinatown anywhere around the world. You'll still get that Chinese feeling. You have to be in the Philippines to experience the Philippines because our hospitality is iba, our food is iba, um, the camaraderie, the camaraderie and the love and the friendship you develop is not overnight. You can't do it by reading something. You can't do it by looking online. You have to come here, you know. And that's why when people do physically come here, that's why they get stuck. That's why people wind up living here or, or overextending or, uh, or, or just like, oh my gosh, I, you know, um, I have a house now I, or I have a condo now. I, I can't believe I'm still here. And that's the magic of the Philippines. You know, you don't want to leave it. You don't want to leave it. And I know so many friends, this is their favorite destination. Um, they love coming here. I have, I'm sorry, I completely forgot your question, but what do I want to share? So yeah, the, um, and anything that, because largely, for example, Filipino cuisine mm. um, has largely gone unnoticed, right? I mean, yeah. people from wherever, they know, they know Japanese food, right? Yes, yes, yes. You know, name me a Jap Japanese dish I can easily That's right. give you, right? Yeah. But for Filipinos, apart mm -hmm. from adobo, mm -hmm. right, um, no one knows about our food. Yes. Right. Yes. So I think largely we're underrated in the sense that there's so much going on here, mm -hmm. but then again, not a lot of people know about the Philippines. Yes. Right. So yes. is there anything that you feel you know th people should discover about our country? They need to come here and go to any island with white sand and have a boodle fight set up for them. Okay, so for those who don't know, what is a boodle fight? A boodle fight is basically you're going to have a leaf, banana leaves spread out on a table. You will have uh, rice will be the foundation. And around that rice, you'll have liempo, which is grilled pork. You'll have grilled shrimps. You'll have mangoes. You'll have cucumber salad. You'll have chicken in a sal pork. You'll have um, an amazing barbecued feast, you know, right in front of you. And here's the killer part, no utensils. You have to eat with your hands. You go, all of you gather around it and just when it's ready to eat, oh, come on, not, boom. You just eat with your hands. And the food will be amazing. The ambiance will be amazing. 
but it's the camaraderie of eating side by side with Pinoy's that just is, is iba. Kaka iba talaga. You can't get that anywhere else. So the boodle fight, you have to experience here. And that's a perfect example because you get all of our food there, right? So mm -hmm. it's pretty much a mix of everything. Mm -hmm. And you get the kind of culture that Filipinos are known for because we like to share, right? Yes. Like um, the, the, the expression for saying hi here in the Philippines is kumain kana or have you eaten? Yes. Right? Yes, yes, yes. So that's actually a perfect way to be able to, yeah. I guess, communicate what we're all about. Yes. Have you ever said yes to somebody who said, kain na tayo? And then, Shepard, you always say, oh, no. Yeah, okay, I don't no, think no. I have. <laughs> diba? You get medyo shy. Well, you should change it next time someone says, oh, kain na. You don't know that. Oh, sige, sige, sige. Uh, what are you eating? Diba? Just, just sit down next to them. They're like, oh. He actually said yes. <laughs> and no one's prepared for that, right? Exactly. And no one's prepared for that. Oh, so I'm going to now. Like, like when like, someone oh, asks you, <laughs> like when someone asks you, how are you? Actually, I'm having a really shitty day, right? Yes. You yes. never say that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just yeah, say yeah, I'm yeah, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dog died, like, right now. Right? <laughs> uh, okay. Kain <laughs> time. So I wanted to ask, if you have any modern day heroes, I mean, you're, you're, you're in the hosting space, uh, you're an adventure athlete as well. Um, who to you is your modern day hero and what qualities um, does this person have that makes him or her your hero? Man, good one, bro. Cue up uh, Whitney Houston in three, <laughs> two, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'll choose two locally okay. that are just so profound. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Maria Ressa oh. of Rappler. Wow. Definitely. I, do, I, do I even, even need to go into what she's going through? But just a strong, amazing, smart woman going up against, you know, the forces of evil. And um, just, wow. You, you know, anyone lesser uh, would have crumbled by now. But uh, she's still staying strong and vigilant and... I'm sure you saw a thousand cuts. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Um, not illegally downloaded, huh? I paid for it. But um, yeah, so sorry, I, I just, Maria Ressa for what she's enduring and going through is just an amazing icon, someone to look mm -hmm. up to. And uh, the second person I'd like to bring up is Gina Lopez. Uh, rest in peace, Gina rest Lopez. In peace, yes. Rest, rest in peace. Uh, just the first politician to ever be fired for doing her job well and good and correctly and efficiently. Insane. Um, but yeah, she's the type of person that not only talks the talk, she walks the walk. You know, and I've been, I've had the pleasure and honor of uh, protesting alongside with her, and uh, she's just so charismatic. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, two women. Um, and that's what's great about the Philippines as well. We have strong women characters, you know. I miss Miriam Defensor Santiago. Oh, I miss her. Really? Yeah, She's the greatest course. president we never had, you know. I will say that outright, but uh, not to get into politics. But uh, so those three are wonderful icons. Um, do, the good ones go, you know. The good ones go fast. But uh, I'm glad that they were in our stream of consciousness at one time. So God bless them. Um, and, of course, our parents, you know. We, we can't... Uh, it's such a cliche to say our parents were heroes to all of us individually, but they, they really are. The ones that were there for us, they really, they really are our rocks in whatever way they uh, helped you out, you know? Um, so I love all parents, especially at this age now. I love Even more. titos and titas, <laughs> you know? I really do. And I see my friends and how, how amazing they are, and I just look at the parents and I'm like, thank you for not raising an asshole. <laughs> You know, for not so. screwing up. For not screwing up. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. So parents, all parents, you know, that were there. Uh, it's tough to raise a kid now, I, I would assume. Right? Okay. I was just curious because I don't know if you've actually given a commencement speech, right? Oh, wow. But if given the chance, what is maybe the main message that you would like to give people who are coming into the world, into the real world? students who maybe have this ideal of what it's like to be out there um, and finding all of this shit that we're in right now. I mean, you 
not necessarily as a host or someone in the entertainment industry, but I guess general advice that, that you would like to give. So the commencement speech will be for the Cebu prison. And no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, but that would be cool to give a commencement speech sure, for and the from Cebu. you. Well, bald, and yeah. you know, it makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> the ones that, yeah, whoever's getting reintroduced back into society, yeah, it'd be um, no. Uh, the one thing that I learned back, you know, looking back at got me to where I, I am now is I believed in myself. I invested in myself. I said, I have to take care of my brand. I have to build my brand. Uh, reputations are not built overnight. Yeah, so those were the important factors to me, and that's what helped me get to where I am now. But out of all those things I just mentioned, it's believe in yourself, believe in your brand. It's okay to watch others who you admire. You know, I'll watch other hosts who I absolutely adore, and, and I, I used to watch Joey Mead a lot, who I think is one of the greatest oh, stage hosts in definitely, general, the TV host, definitely. right? And, and just her flair, her opening number. Um, you know, and then from a TV professional side, a uh, huge fan of... Um, uh, uh, Seacrest, yeah, Seacrest. He is so smooth. You know, it doesn't get a lot of credit for for what he does, but he just makes the show run smooth. You right. know, and and so you, you know, you watch your your idols, and and you just blend and get the best of everybody. But you also have to remember to put in your personal flavor, because I'm hiring John, I'm hiring Revilson, I'm not hiring a wannabe Seacrest. I'm I'm gonna hire you. So yeah, that that's always been my um, M O. Okay. Know. Yeah, I'm just curious because um, here you are, you're out there, um, mm. your stage is not just Asia, but the entire world, mm. right? Um, what do you do at the level that you're in to, say, prepare for hosting an episode of Asia's Got Talent? What, do you have any specific routines or um, uh, mindset or mantras that you say to yourself in order to prepare for that night's performance? Mm, what we did was got a good night's rest. That was number one. We had to make sure we rested well because we are on our feet for a long time. It's a physical show as well, not just uh, a lot of uh, script reading, but it was very taxing on the body. And we always made sure to get a good workout the night before. Oh, that was okay. also part of our um, you know, uh, traditions because we felt, you know, I, we've been working out, Mark and I, for a long time. We always knew that it, it just helped blood flow into the parts right. that need blood. And, and just, just to get a good workout in, you just feel better. You feel lighter. And uh, we always met up early. We, we, we made it a point to wake up two hours earlier than call time and just go through the script. You know, you're only as good and talented as your, your knowledge of the script. If you know the script, you can go in any direction you want and put in your own personal flavor. So uh, it, was, it was very important for us to, to master the script and just know what was going on and be prepared for anything. And uh, yeah, those are the top three things. And of course, we always add, add have fun. Always have fun with it. And, and he was there to back me up. I was there to back him up. We, we've covered each other so many times, you know, and uh, it, it, it uh, made for a really great day during rehearsals. Everyone hated rehearsals. We loved it because we felt that it was part of Showtime all, as well. So, yeah, it's, a, it's the attitude, yeah. really. It's, it's the attitude. And I can just imagine the, the level of engagement that you have um, with, with the crew mm -hmm. on, on the shoot day itself with the audience. I mean, I'm sure you feed off um, the audience when you're there. Um, I could assume that it's something that would really keep you up at night, right? I mean, like, yeah. for me personally, if I'm engaged in something that's exciting and big, usually I have a hard time settling down at night because I think about it or if there's something oh. big the next day. Um, is there anything that you do that kind of allows you to kind of decompress or at the other end also to prepare and not get too excited? Excellent question. I have never had a problem falling asleep even the night before a big event. And it's always in my mind. I'm an overthinker like you, but I'm okay. I can actually fall asleep. Um, 
Actually, that's, that's, I consider it a problem because I can fall asleep anywhere. <laughs> uh, I fall asleep while driving, you know? I mean, it's a horrible habit, but uh, I'm thankful that I don't have insomnia problems. I don't have to take pills to fall asleep, so we're okay. But uh, um, I, I've learned that you shouldn't worry about things you can't control. You know, I used to be a big worry wart and overthinker, like I said, but if you, if you can't control it, don't worry about it. You know, deal with it when you have to cross that bridge, you know, as they say. Uh, co totally murdered that quote, but you know what I mean. Deal with it when we get, when we get there. So, right. um, yeah, uh, be in the now. I'm very big on be in the now, mm -hmm. you know, be in the moment. Don't, don't think about the past, no regrets. Uh, plan a bit for the future, but be, be in the moment right now. So that's also help. That's also what helps. Yeah, you've been in the industry for a while, mm -hmm. and um, what is the one thing that you wish you could have known sooner or learned sooner that is now helping you navigate your career or your life, being Revilson Fernandez here, 2020? Ooh, good one. Well. <laughs> Save <laughs> number one. I uh, I wish I saved a lot more when I was younger and uh, made wiser investments, uh, but I didn't. And I'm telling you all now: save <laughs> and make wise investments. Real estate is great. Stocks is fantastic. Uh, stay away from restaurants and bars unless you have a lot of money. It's fine. And. Um, that's from a financial standpoint, from a spiritual and, and personal standpoint. I'm quite happy with the path I took, but I wish I stayed with, I stayed in touch with friends more, a, a lot more friends than what I, I wish I stayed in touch more with a lot of friends, you know? Um, what do you mean by that? Are these people that were in your life earlier and now you find because life gets in the way you don't um, stay in touch with um, as much as you used to or totally gone from your life? Uh, I'm talking about my Philippine life. So when I moved here, I met a lot of wonderful people uh, and those are the ones I really considered my friends. And uh, they're my friends to this day and they're extremely successful. Uh, they're the movers and shakers of the industries that I partake in, you know, restaurants, bars, uh, uh, production houses, you know, modeling agencies. We all did the grind together, and I'm so happy and proud of all my friends. You are one of them. I'm, I'm a, you're a shining example. But I wish I was able to just stay in touch with them because I have so many creative I, I want to collab with each and every single one, you know, but I had to, my own path. I had to stay busy and, and create my career. And I just wish I had the time because now I want to collab with all of them. They're, they're doing great, but I, I, I'm busy. They're busy. Uh, so there, I, I don't know if I have a solution, but I just wish uh, I had more time to keep in touch with them. Yeah. Yeah. I guess um, those are some of the, 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 the disadvantages of success, right? I mean, uh, you, I think some things sort of kind of go away um, as a direct result of you being who you are. I mean, you're, you're a busy guy. You're into a lot of things. And you can't do it all, right? You can't do it all. So, so Wilson, you're in your 40s, um, healthy, um, excellent career. Um, I'm sure dying is the farthest thing from your mind right now, even with the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. But... If, if that were to cross your mind, if you were maybe to, to move on to you know, uh, a better place, what would your epitaph say? <laughs> I'm sorry I'm late. I'm always late. I'm still late. I'm always late. I, I might as well put I'm sorry I'm late on the tombstone because it, it just would, people would be like, Typical Revilson, late for his own funeral, pa. You know, so just crack one last joke, and it's honest. Everyone knows this. Uh, I'm shocked I was two minutes late here. That was, that was a shock. <laughs> Butipa, there's an epidemic, but uh, a pandemic. Um, yeah, I, something like that, something funny, you know, something to be like, that's Revilson, you know, you got one last in there. And, uh, and it would be a fist bump. 
it would be a molded, uh, it would be a mold of my hand in cement, a fist bump. <laughs> so that you come visit me, you see my line, and then yeah. you fist bump me. That's what I would do. I, it wouldn't be anything uh, stoic or whatever, you know. Here lies, you know. Well, that's not you. That's, that's not, not you. Me. No, no way. No. Not, not Roby. Not no, 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 no. And then it would be a bull shepherd for like coins and if you want. <laughs> Yun, that's it. If there's one thing about you, I, I think I cannot put you in a box, you know, you're, you, are, you are into a number of things that you're really good at. And, and I'm kind of struggling if I were to, let's say, based on this conversation, pick up on points and apply it to my life. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything that you would recommend that you do in your life that maybe I or any other person for that matter can maybe try to take on? Um, because maybe it's not that tough or maybe if you can do it, like you said, then anyone can do it. Is there anything that you would recommend people try on their own that you were successful in doing or achieving in the past? I recommend, especially now, people must get their personal advocacy, whatever it is, health, wellness, good governance, climate change, animal welfare, human rights, whatever your passion is, Get that one advocacy and protect it. Be passionate about it. Uh, promote it. Create awareness. And your advocacy is? I have several that I'm very passionate about. Uh, climate change, of course, is very, very important to me, especially in, this, in the Philippines and our waters. Um, that's my main one. Uh, children, you know, uh, especially, especially the ones that can't defend themselves, um, human trafficking, uh, the deaf community is something I'm very, very close with um, or has a special place in my heart as well. Uh, so yeah, I, you don't want to get too many. It's okay, you can have as many as you want and help as many as you want, but to be more uh, impactful, have one, maybe two, and just pour as much of your free time into it as possible, you know? So uh, yeah, whatever it is, just... Uh, and people think you have to be an artista or you have to be famous or you have to have, you know, thousands of uh, millions or thousands of followers. No, but everybody here has a platform. You know, everybody here, if you have more than two, three followers or five friends on social media, you have a platform. And everyone thinks, oh, how can I be an environmentalist? Do I need to take classes or whatever? No, we're all environmentalists. It just depends how much of an environmentalist uh, at what scale and degree. If you did not throw a piece of trash on the ground because it's medjubastos and you were raised right, you're an environmentalist, you know? So, uh, but also if you recycle and, and live a sustainable life, you're also a res um, an environmentalist. So yeah, it, it's all labels, but as long as you do your research and you do good things and you use your platform wisely, um, I think that will just enrich your life so much more. It really will. Okay. So what would be your advocacy? My advocacy definitely would be in line with nation building mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship. There you, you go. Know, I think um, uh, we were always raised um, to be good employees, which mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. because I think there is a time to consider being working for someone mm -hmm. and also a time to consider doing your own thing, yeah. right? The thing is not everyone can do their own thing, whether it's a function of maybe their limitations or maybe it's just not something they're cut out for. Mm -hmm. But I think to give your chance the opportunity to start something is something that I really want people to, to consider, yeah. right? Um, mm. it, it's a tough life. Entrepreneurship is a tough life. Mm. Um, it's something that I've been doing for uh, almost 20 years. And, and I really know that it's not for everyone just because mm -hmm. it's, it, it has a million challenges that you have to overcome. Mm -hmm. And once you overcome that, that's not even um, going to cut it, right? Because mm -hmm. it's always a constant mm -hmm. trying to reinvent yourself and, and, and trying to do your next thing, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but you know, people have to give it a shot because I feel that um, the Philippines in particular uh, does not give at least our environment does not give people that much of a chance to start something, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Whether it's how they were brought up 
or how they were taught in school. Um, but I really do feel that I think um, the more entrepreneurs we have in the country, I think the more um, options or opportunities there will be for people to, to help in this nation building effort that we have, that we should have at least. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's my personal advocacy. Mm -hmm. That's why most of what we do is um, really geared towards trying to help people, capacitate them, and, and try to give them the breaks that they need so that mm -hmm. they, can, they can have that chance mm -hmm. at it. Yeah. Right? And yeah. if you don't succeed, then you know, at least you gave it a shot. Exactly. Right? You, that's the one thing. You don't go to bed at night saying what if. Exactly. That's, that's so important for a man or a woman. Yeah, of course. And, and I love the quote of, you know, you only have one life. You don't have a practice life. You get one life. Don't live it pursuing someone else's dream. You know, make your own, you know, or at least give it a shot. At least you, you okay, I tried it. I did it. I failed. I did it, you know. So, uh, yeah, good on you to give people these opportunities. So, good advocacy. Go yeah. yeah. And the thing is, not everyone, um, because I, I know of some people who will never entertain entrepreneurship, mm. but they are also the best at what they do. And they find meaning and purpose being the one that gets this person's idea and makes it fly, mm. right? Because they mm -hmm. believe in the advocacy mm. and because they believe in the collective effort and where it's going to go, mm. right? So, so that's the other side of the coin, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're starting something and they're also supporting something so that as a team, you're able to make that vision, whoever's vision mm -hmm. it is, yeah. a reality, right? They're called venture capitalists. <laughs> They're called angels. <laughs> no, you need them. They yeah. provide a, um, they're part of the system. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So Ravilson, for those who would like to, um, I guess, follow you or, um, I, I know you're, you're, you're one of the biggest TV hosts out there. You're, you, you've been with, Channel 7 for a long time. Uh, you have your regular shows. Uh, talk to us about that. Yes, yes, yes. Ang Pinaka, which I've been doing for almost 15 years now, it's a show of lists. And we basically talk about anything and everything under the sun. Uh, that's what's great about this show. It's, it's for everybody. And when I say everybody, I'm talking lolas to kids to uh, working class to upper class. It, it, every week is a different topic. And uh, yeah, it's a show of lists. Pinoy's, we love lists. We love listing things down. I don't know why, but it's in our blood. <laughs> and uh, and uh, what's great, the reason why the show has been so successful for so long, every year the list changes. You know, number one can be uh, out of the top spot and a new, right. you know, uh, new number. And you're on your, how many seasons have you been doing this? Personally, I've been doing it 13 years, wow. but the show's been on for 15 years. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. And it can go on forever, you know. Uh, when, once, once we'll always have lists. We'll always have lists. Of everything. We'll always have lists. Uh, on, on sexiest legs of, uh, you know. Of last year is different from this, exactly. this year, right? It'll be, it'll be different, yeah, yeah. Well, this year, uh, just shave it. We don't, you know, nobody shaved their legs. Uh, I'm talking about the women, of course, you know. Uh, so no one will make the <laughs> sexy legs list this year. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, cut that out. But um, uh, recently, GMA News, of course, due to the pandemic, mm -hmm. we had to dominate uh, our airways with news. Of course, we have to let the public know what's going on. But we've decided, you know, we're also an entertainment company and uh, we still have to entertain our viewers. So uh, thankfully, the... Uh, 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 the brainchilds. Uh, uh, so thankfully, the writers and producers got together and said, "Hey, let's let's create shows, uh, grab some of our hosts, and we'll do programs that are just about being at home and shooting from home and tips from home and hacks from home." So uh, I myself and uh, my co-host Tony Pet Gaba, we uh, have a show called Homework, which is on Thursdays at 8 p.m. And uh, yeah, we talk about life hacks and how to survive the new normal and, and everything from cooking to cars to maintenance to uh, making laba or, or uh, plant, being a plantito or a plantita to exercise, everything. We, we make you fall in love with your home again okay. and, and realizing that there are certain things in your home that you can use not just for its intended original purpose, but you can still 
make it into a gym or you can still make it into, you know, um, an obstacle course or what have you. So it's fun. It's been really fun being creative and it's been quite a challenge though working from home because I'm so used to crew and I'm so used to setting, right. you know, a, 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 a sound guy and a floor director and a director. And, and But now you're your own host and director and writer and, right? So my makeup is horrible, by the way. <laughs> I, I doing my own makeup. I look like joke, the Joker. You know what I'm saying? But uh, I gotta get my own coffee pa. You know, it's, it's oh, so sad. Life it, is so hard. It's t it's tough. It's tough I for hate you, man. you, pandemic. I miss my crew. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but it's been a, ch a wonderful challenge because it brings me back to my film school days of you know student films. So right. okay, never mind. Okay, lang. Um, yeah, so that's homework. Eight thirties. Oh, that's, so that's homework on GMA News at 8 p.m. And, of course, I'm on all social media outlets. Um, uh, Mark and Rove is a, another podcast we have that uh, I... Or is a podcast that I have. Sorry. Mark and Rove is a podcast that I also have with my buddy Mark Nelson. I've and, seen that. Yeah, it's yeah. quite fun. It's quite fun. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, just keeping busy, you know, keeping busy. Um, and uh, just putting out content, good content. And uh, staying out of trouble. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's about it. That's about it. Okay. For those who, because you've been doing this a while at home, filming mm -hmm. all of this, mm -hmm. and um, you, I'm sure there are a million things that you would want for people to see, but at the same time, uh, content is something that uh, you're also careful not to overdo. Because I would assume that, I mean, yes, you are a public figure, but you also have your private life, your private moments, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you draw the line? Bro, I thought I drew the line from, from not having... I never granted interviews in my house or, or people to come over. Only, I remember Solen Husoff, she brought her show into my house because the producer is my producer and she said, hey, Solen is going to your house to shoot your closet. I couldn't say no. And, I'm like, and the other one was Cara David, who, who did something in my house and uh, years ago and, and I felt so uncomfortable because my home is my sanctuary and that's where I decompress and I don't like to, yeah, I, I just like to keep my private life private. So when they offered this show to be shot in my house, it was, it, the, the idea was intriguing, but it also, I had to put on a new hat, I guess, so to speak. Um, because when I'm on in the studio at GMA or I'm on stage hosting in you know in front of a, a huge audience, um, I'm I'm I put on a host mode, you know. But when I'm home, it's Menjo Mahid up to put on host mode when it's just me, and and I just feel weird about it. So it's almost like I'm relearning how to host again. Okay. Which is fascinating. It's really fascinating. And uh, is it because there's no one there that you can feed off of? Because I find that like personally for me. Um, when I have to, let's say, give a talk in front of an audience, mm -hmm. I feed off of the energy of the audience, right? I look right. people in the eyes, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. kind of how I gauge how I will say the next thing, yeah. right? But in the case of being, let's say, on Zoom, it's a totally different thing because you're just talking to yourself, right? So okay. it's a different thing to, you know, have the, the same energy or... Yeah. Um, I don't know. Is that something that you, you feel as well? I mean... I no, I'm exactly like you, but I'm opposite. I'm actually more dal dal at home, more energetic, more like I have to. After I record myself, I have to replay it and see if I'm o sobra, if I'm OA, because oh. since no one, I don't have a crew and I don't have you know a lot of people or a studio audience or whatever. Uh, I can be myself. Okay. Yeah, so I'm actually more energetic. At okay. Home. So it's like, wow. So when you're in, wow, you're in front of like the camera, drugs, Wilson, you know? <laughs> when you're in front of the camera, you actually have to tone things down, right? You know, I, at, at, home, at, at home. At home. Yeah, at yeah, home. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But in like in GMA in the studio, I have to be hosty, Revilson, right, you know, right, proper. Right, 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 uh, right. Uh, salutations. Good evening, everybody. You know, whatever. <laughs> but at home, oh my God, I'm crazy. I'm crazy. It's like it's. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> But I, I then, yeah, like I said, I have to replay it and check, oh, wow, was I medyo magulo or, you know. Uh, yeah, so I have to, that's my problem. I'm opposite of you. I have to see if I'm uh, sobra. <laughs> wow. Okay. Does it make sense? It, it does. It okay. does. Actually, it, it's, like, um, it's like you know that you have to put up 
a performance, but you can't gauge exactly how you're going to do it because this is the first time that you're looking at it from the perspective of, I guess in this case, the director, right? Or the writer, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so it's totally different in, in that sense. Well, I have no one there to, right. I don't feel like people are judging me. You know, I don't feel like uh, the PAs and the, the crew in the back are, uh, wow, did he just say that? Or, you know, well, well mali yung line, no? Or whatever. I can just do whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I feel so much more freer and looser. And um, I'm having a great time. I'm having a great time actually shooting stuff. And, oh, and my co-host, sorry. My co-host, Tony Pett, is a theater actor. Okay. And uh, in addition to being a host. So our, our writer... Um, um, Oh my God, Augie Rivera, our writer, our head writer, Augie Rivera, has been writing in a lot of, uh, in the script, it's been uh, more acting, not hosting. So we're acting things out at home. So I, I'm not an actor, but I'm, I'm actually embracing this, this uh, things where we have to reenact things and it, take, you know, it requires a little bit of acting and I'm just having a blast. Of course, I'm, I'm bringing uh, Tony Pett's level of acting down but i'm raising mine up you know because he's so good <laughs> and i'm horrible but uh yeah it's been so much fun i'm having a really good time you know speaking of acting mm. i came into some research where uh i think you mentioned that given a chance you really want to take a shot at acting yes sir yeah right it's super fun it's super I, but I, have you ever done it have you ever no acted no i've done a couple music videos you okay, know but no nothing lines. like with lines and no no but no. that's something you want to do i wouldn't mind yeah g diving into it uh, any role uh, at first i always thought i'd be a comedic actor type obviously but you know doing a serious role would be kind of cool too um it's funny i i i, I remember auditioning for um uh, Crazy Rich Asians. You auditioned for that? Yes, yes. Wow. A manager sent me, uh, <laughs> one, of my, one of my managers in Singapore sent me. For what role? The, the lead, the lead no, actor? No, no, no. Not, 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 uh, yeah, not, not the lead role. It was, oh my gosh, yeah, I have to remember. It was Olivier, Olivier, Olivier uh, he was the flamboyant cousin. Now that role oh. went to the only Filipino in the cast. Oh, his name escapes me, but I've met him a couple times. I've seen his stand-up. Um, Nico Santos! Yon, yon. Okay. okay. It was for the role of uh, the lead's cousin, who was very flamboyant in the book. Okay. And the role went, unfortunately, to Nico Santos, who did a wonderful job, but um, if I got it, I would have killed it. I would have killed it. Absolutely. I wouldn't have been gay outright, uh, but I would have killed that role. I tell you, I would have owned it. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, Can you play gay? You know what? My gay would be like this. Okay. Straight. All right. But then like if my boyfriend would walk in, he'd be like, hey, so John, what's up? Hey, baby, how you doing? <laughs> what's up? Yeah, yeah. I do it okay. like that, but so, I'd be very straight. You yeah, know? I think I think in the next movie, there's going to be an, another movie, right? So, three. There'll be three. Yeah, there, there, there's going to be three. That's so, right. um, if for some reason something happens to Nico, okay. then we know that you had something to do with it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you know, maybe we'll get Carlo Ledesma to film his audition, and uh, you know, purposely. Yeah, I think. But but Carlo, Carlo, that guy's fantastic. I mean, he's he's a he's a TV commercial director now. Yeah. I want to and say feature. Feature commercial. Of feature film, bro. Yeah. He had Fe a, and a feature film. Yeah. He, did, Sunod. did he had a... Sunod. He, I think he had a Hollywood movie uh, or something or a TV, TV um, uh, feature that came out. He did a feature. It was a horror movie. I think it's Sunod. Sunod. And it was third place in Cinemalaya. Cinemalaya. I'm not quite sure. Google gods help us out, but uh, fantastic guy. And um, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag after 15 years. Carlo Ledesma knew you were going to get the other hosting gig. So he purposely produced your segment and made it really <laughs> shitty and presented it and like messed up your lines and like, you know, edited you out and like, you know, shot like your forehead long. Bro, he did this on purpose. He told me, he's like, dude, I'm worried about John. He's gonna take my gig out. I was like, dude, just, just give him a shitty production. And he did. So sorry, sorry, cat's out, sorry. 
I held it for 15 years, brother. <laughs> but you know what? Um, I think everything happens for a reason. Yes. And you know, um, me not getting that gig um, is what made um, everything that I do now possible, right? Because I'm not as good a host as you are, right? I mean, that's a given. But I think we each have our own paths that um, we should take in life. Yeah. And the things that you aspire to and never get mm. are the things that were never meant to be for you to begin with. I think um, you know you are the best at what you do because that's who you're made to be. You are mm. Irvilson Fernandez. You are, mm. in my opinion, uh, one of the best male gigolos <laughs> slash hosts that we've had in the region, right? Thank you. It's, uh, <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's who you were meant to be, man. Thank you. Um, you know, luck plays a, a big part in this too. Luck plays a massive part in, you know, for Asia's Got Talent, we were actually third choice. The first choice was a dear friend of ours, Ollie uh, Pettigrew and, and another co-host. But Ollie at the time was offered another show in the States. So he was juggling between moving to the States and or getting the, you know, this uh, Asia's Got Talent gig, which was the biggest production at the time. But of course, there was not, there, we didn't have this, he didn't have the security of knowing if it would go multi-seasons. But the show in the States was a magazine show that was daily. Right. And um, he went with the States gig. So that ruled that him out, him and his co-host. So Mark and I were like, we heard, and then we're like, hey, Mark, they, they, uh, Ollie didn't get the gig. He, he, it's still available. Oh, my gosh. So we started praying again. This is the second time I, I prayed for something really hard. And, uh, <laughs> and then it went to our other friends, Alan, Wu, uh, Alan Wong and Justin Bratton. And we couldn't hate on them because they're dear friends of ours, fellow hosts as well. Okay. And we were so happy for them. But Alan couldn't get out of his MTV contract at the time. Oh. So we were like, and then they said, oh, sorry, you guys can't get the gig either. So we were like, oh man, there's a chance, there's a chance. So yeah, we, um, we, we got the gig. We got the gig. After three, two other hosts miraculously couldn't get the gig at the time. And they both wanted it, you know, both sets wanted it. So my point is luck does play a huge role in a lot of things, you know. You know as much as you can put yourself in the position to succeed and you do whatever you can, whatever it takes, lady luck, man, you know, uh, is always there. So. Yeah, and the number three, third place, seems to be a common thread in, in, in your story, right? You were yeah. third place in Amazing Race Asia, now third choice, but it worked out for you in the end. I think for both, for both. That's right. Because um, the That's first right. and second place placers in Amazing Race Asia, I mean, don't have anywhere near the career that you have, obviously. Right, right, right. So, right. Right. so yeah, you are the bridesmaid of the bridesmaids. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. We are the Kelly Clarksons of hosting. <laughs> <laughs> Since you've been gone. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's been a blessing. You know, you don't have to win all the time. Right. You right. don't have to win all the time. Yeah. You don't have to be the champion. Uh, just, just make a name for yourself. And American Idol is a case in point, right? Yeah. The winners don't necessarily have the best careers. Exactly. But the ones who are third, fourth right. place. Right, right. They're big. Yeah. Right? Pfft. Ruben Stuttered, baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Did he win? No, I don't know. Ruben Stuttered. <laughs> no. I don't even. He's one of the. Yeah, <laughs> I, know, yeah I remember who he. I, I think he has a semi career. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. But he won, right? I'm shocked that I remember his name. And I don't know. I just remember Ruben Stuttered. Shows our age. It does, yeah, yeah. it does, it does. So sad. Um, he came to the Philippines with David Foster. Uh, when David Foster did his, he, David Foster has a roving concert every once in a while with, uh, it's called David Foster and Friends. So okay. he invites uh, uh, fellow musicians. And the last one was with Dave, Ruben Stuttered. <laughs> I am old. Oh my God. <laughs> David Foster. Uh, it was an honor working with David Foster though for, for Asia's, Asia's Got, Got Talent. Talent. Yeah, he was our Simon Cowell. Right, and right. Uh, he was amazing. Oh my gosh, to work with that level of talent and, and an icon, you know. Uh, so Asia's Got Talent for us was 
the pinaja, you know, the creme de la creme, that was Hollywood for us. We're working with crew that have worked on other uh, got talents around the world. Our, our producers were, you know, from Got Talents India, from Got Talent Singapore, um, Got Talent China. Um, just, just people with wonderful resumes and experience. So, you know, to be Filipino boys representing and, 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 and helming the, this million dollars, millions of dollars production was such an honor, bro. It really, really was. So we, we really put our A game into that. And um, as much as I'm proud of Asia's, uh, as much as I'm proud of Amazing Race Asia, uh, Asia's Got Talent was a wonderful working experience. Yeah. 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 And it's really been an amazing career for you um, here in the Philippines. Just the, the longevity of having Ang Pinaka there. Seems like, you know, you're going to be doing it till you're a senior citizen. I, I don't think uh, it's showing any signs of stopping. And, um, you know, America's Got Talent, uh, sorry, uh, Asia's Got Talent, I think, mm -hmm. um, also is another show that is a stepping stone for you. I feel that, mm. um, you know, where you are right now, I think you're, you're poised for, for other bigger things. Mm. And I can't wait to, to find out what those things will be in the coming years. If someone were to follow in your footsteps, mm. there's someone there, there's a guy or girl out there mm -hmm. who wants to get a shot at being a host, mm -hmm. being a presenter, mm -hmm. um, what would be the best advice that you could give to that person knowing what you know now in, in your endeavors? Yeah, uh, the same advice I give to everybody who is starting out in the hosting business. And uh, number one, don't burn your bridges. Be nice and kind to everyone, including crew, you know, because um, you never know they're they're going to be the directors and the producers that will be hiring in the future. And uh, yeah, you don't want to step on any toes and burn any bridges and, and just make enemies, especially in this very tight, uh, very tight uh, stratosphere that we're all in. Um, and then, of course, as mentioned before, believe in yourself. That's, that's the absolute uh, game changer. You know, you, if you... If you don't believe in yourself, that's it. Why, why are you even in this game? So that's number, number two. Uh, this is, of course, in no order of importance. And um, if they're just starting out, get as many rounds in as possible. Mm. You know, get those gigs that you don't want to get. Right, get, right. get those 2,000 peso gigs that are right. in, in uh, you know, Kainta, um, you know, hosting a launch of a detergent or, or host, host your friend's uh, baptism uh, reception or, or, you know, just, just get as many rounds in as possible. Just keep doing it. Keep working on your craft. And, uh, uh, you know, don't charge anything in the meantime. Um, just, just do it because you love it. I read somewhere that Joe Rogan, fantastic host, uh, the face of UFC, basically. And now the face of uh, Spotify as and well. And now the face and the voice, voice of, Spotify. of Spotify. Right, yeah. right. But for UFC, he was hosting the, all the matches for free. For, for, he did about 15 shows wow. for free. Wow. Right? Okay. And, and, and that's when UFC didn't have uh, any money to pay him. And they just said, hey, can you, would you just mind doing this? Because, you know, you're really good at it. And then, and then uh, Dana White at the time was like, you know, we, we can't pay you. But, you know, um, just, just hook, us, hook us up, I guess, basically. And Rogan was like, I'll do it. I'll do it for free. You know, I don't mind because he, he loved it. And he was practicing his craft. And, and now he clearly gets paid. Right. Obviously, he gets paid. But... You know, sometimes it's not worth, it's not about the money. You know, it's not about the money. Just, just do it because you love it. Because I would imagine that gig um, pretty much set him up for what he was going to be doing later on, right? I mean, just mm -hmm. the, the sheer amount of experience yeah. that you get from doing that. Yes. I yes. mean, that's, that's in, in, in local speak, that's like matricula or that's your tuition, yeah. I would think, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paid your dues with that, you know. And... Um, Again, it wasn't work for him because he was passionate about MMA. He was passionate about the martial arts, and he's a passionate host. So, to do that for free was nothing to him. You know, it's just a bonus that he's getting paid now. And uh, yeah, so that's how you treat things. You know, treat it like don't treat it as a job. Don't treat it as work. Um, treat it as a learning experience. Everything is a learning experience. 
And uh, yeah, those are the three things that uh, I would recommend. Yeah. yeah. You know, Ravilson, we've never had uh, a conversation this long talking <laughs> about your career. Um, it, it's been truly um, enlightening for me um, as someone who's always followed you in your endeavors here locally and abroad. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very proud of you as a Filipino who's embraced um, your homeland and considering that you weren't even born and raised here. I think that really speaks a lot about um, the Filipino-ness in you. And, and, and I must say we're all very proud of um, what you've achieved. And I hope that you, know, you continue to trailblaze for us in the coming years. I, I know a lot of people who, who really look up to you. And um, you know, it, it's just great that we have someone like you or, or Wilson Fernandez who's out there um, being the kooky guy um, <laughs> that you are, but at the same time really being an excellent role model for the youth. So thank you, Wilson, for guessing on the podcast. My goodness. Um, I'm not good at getting, uh, taking compliments, so I heard that the best way and the best response is just simply thank you. I, I heard you loud and clear, and I'm so grateful, and my heart is brimming with with, uh, with love and uh, thank you for saying all those wonderful things. Um, I take my career very seriously and uh, I worked hard to, where, to get to where I am and, and to have someone as successful as you say those wonderful things, it just validates everything I've done. So I appreciate it, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you, bro. I'd give you a hug, but I, we can't. So here na lang, like this. Post-vaccination, we will. <laughs> done, done. And Spartan. Yes, I'll see you there. Wearing tutus. Uh, okay. Okay. You got yeah. it. Thank you, bro. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. This episode is brought to you by TechnoGym. We've partnered with TechnoGym for equipment recommendations for your home gym. So if you're looking for gear that will help you elevate your home gym experience to the next level, just go to technogym.com and type the Methods to Greatness promo code MTG. That's MTG and we'll hook you up with the best premium home gym equipment in the market today. If you would like me to interview anyone on the face of the earth and want them on the podcast, or if you want to collaborate with us for future content or sponsorship opportunities, or if you just have any recommendations on how we can get better, just send us an email at hello at methodstogreatness.com. That's hello at methodstogreatness.com. Until then, we'll see you next time.